by the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, one with Louisa, the little daughter of the divine will, I enter into the holy divine will. Come, divine will, come beat in my every heartbeat, come breathe in my every breath, come pray, adore, and reign in me. In the name of everyone and everything, past, present, and future, in, with, through, and for Jesus, Mary and Louisa. In, with, and for all, that all may be for the glory of God and the good of all souls. Giving to God as if all lived in the most holy divine will. United with creation, redemption, and sanctification, praying as one in that one eternal act. For the kingdom to come, reign on earth. Fiat. Book of Heaven, Volume 4, Part 9. July 23, 1901. Jesus speaks about his will and about charity. As I was with many doubts about my state, on coming, my adorable Jesus told me, Daughter, do not fear. What I recommend to you is that you remain always conformed to my will, because when the divine will is in the soul, neither the diabolical will nor the human have the strength to enter the soul to make a mockery of her. After this, I seemed to see him crucified, and since the Lord had shared with me not only his pains, but some sufferings of another person, he added, this is true charity, to destroy oneself in order to give life to others, to take upon oneself the evils of others, and to give me one's own goods. July 27, 1901. Doubts of the Confessor. The Answer of Jesus. Since the Confessor had raised some doubts, as blessed Jesus came, I saw the confessor with him, and he was saying to him, My operating is always leaning upon the truth, and even though many times it appears obscure, under enigmas, however, one cannot but say that it is the truth. And even though the creature does not understand my operating with clarity, this does not destroy the truth. On the contrary, it makes one comprehend much better that it is a divine way of operating. In fact, since the creature is finite, she cannot embrace and comprehend the infinite. At the most, she can comprehend and embrace a few glimmers. As for example, the many things said by me in scripture and my way of operating in the saints, has this perhaps been understood with all clarity? Oh, how many things are left obscured and in the enigma. And yet, how many minds of the erudite and learned have tired themselves in interpreting them? And what have they yet understood? One can say absolutely nothing compared to what is left to be known. But does this perhaps prejudice the truth? Not at all. On the contrary, it makes it shine more. Therefore, your eye must be kept on whether there is true virtue and whether in everything it can be felt that the truth is present, though sometimes obscured. 
As for the rest, one must remain tranquil and in holy peace. Having said this, he disappeared, and I returned inside myself. July 30th, 1901. Pride has ruined the world. The virtue of humility. As I was in my usual state, blessed Jesus transported me outside of myself into the midst of many people. What blindness! Almost all were blind and a few of short sight. Only very few appeared like the sun in the midst of the stars with extremely sharp sight, all intent on the divine sun and this sight was conceded to them because it was fixed in the light of the word humanit. How compassion, Jesus told me. My daughter, how pride has ruined the world. It has reached the point of destroying that small light of reason which all carry with them at birth. Know, however, that the virtue which most exalts God is humility and the virtue which most exalts the creature before God and men is humility. Having said this, he disappeared. Later, he came back all panting and afflicted, and he added, My daughter, three terrible chastisements are about to happen. And he disappeared like a flash without giving me the time to tell him one word. August 3rd, 1901. The soul who possesses grace has authority over hell, over man, and over God himself. This morning, my adorable Jesus was not coming. Then, after much waiting, the Virgin Mama came bringing him almost by force. But Jesus would escape. Then the Most Holy Virgin told me, My daughter, do not become tired of asking for him. Rather, be importunate, because this escaping of his is a sign that he wants to send some chastisement, and therefore he escapes the sight of his beloved ones. You, however, do not stop, because the soul who possesses grace has authority over hell, over men, and over God himself. In fact, since grace is part of God himself, as the soul possesses it, does she perhaps not have power over that which she possesses? Then, after much resistance, forced by the Queen Mama, and importuned by me, he came, but with an imposing, serious appearance, such that one would not dare to speak. I did not know what to do to make him break that appearance so imposing. I thought I would come out speaking nonsense, saying to him, My sweet good, let us love each other. If we ourselves do not love each other, who else can love us? And if you are not content with my love, who will ever be able to content you? Oh, please, give me a sure sign that you are content with my love. Otherwise I faint, I die. But who can say all the nonsense I spoke? I believe it is better to move on. However, it seemed that with this, I was able to break that imposing air he had. And he told me, Only when your love surpasses the river of the iniquities of men, then will I be content with your love. So think of increasing your love, for I will be more content with you. Having said this, he disappeared. August 5th, 1901. Mortification is the sight of the soul. 
As I was in my usual state, my blessed Jesus was delaying in coming. I felt I was dying for the pain of his privation, when all of a sudden he came and told me, My daughter, just as the eyes are the sight of the body, so mortification is the sight of the soul. Therefore mortification can be called eyes of the soul. And he disappeared. August 6, 1901. The love of the blessed is a property of God, while the love of the pilgrim souls is like a property which he is an act of acquiring. This morning, after I received communion, my adorable Jesus made himself seen all in suffering and offended, such as to arouse compassion. I clasped him all to myself, and I said to him, My sweet good, how lovable and desirable you are. How can men not love you? Even worse, they offend you. By loving you, one finds everything, and the loving of you contains all goods, while by not loving you, every good escapes from us. Yet who loves you? But oh please, my dearest treasure, put aside the offenses of men and let us pour ourselves out in loving each other for a little. Then Jesus called the whole celestial court to be spectator of our love. And he said, the love of the whole of heaven would not render me satisfied and content if yours were not there united with it. More so, since that love is my property, which no one can take away from me, while the love of the pilgrim souls is like a property which I am in act of acquiring. And since my grace is part of me, and my being is most active, as it enters into hearts, the pilgrim souls can make traffic of love, and this traffic expands the properties of my love. And I feel such taste and pleasure that if it were missing, I would remain embittered. This is why, without your love, the love of all heaven would not render me fully content. And you know how to traffic well in my love, for by loving me in everything, you will render me happy and content. Who can say how amazed I was left on hearing this, and how many things I comprehended about this love? But my tongue begins stammering, and therefore I stop here. August 21st, 1901. The Celestial Mama teaches the secret of true happiness. As I was in my usual state, I found myself outside of myself. After going round and round in search of Jesus, I found the Queen Mama instead. Oppressed and tired as I was, I said to her, My most sweet Mama, I lost the way to find Jesus. I do not know where else to go, nor what to do in order to find him again. While saying this, I was crying, and she said to me, My daughter, follow me, and you will find the way, and Jesus. Even more, I want to teach you the secret of how you can always be with Jesus, and live always content and happy also on this earth. Fix in your interior that there is only Jesus and you in the world, and no one else, and that him alone must you please satisfy and love. And from him alone must you expect to be loved back and contented in everything. If you are in this way with Jesus, 
you will no longer be affected. Whether you are surrounded by scorns or praises, by relatives or strangers, by friends or enemies, Jesus alone will be all your contentment, and Jesus alone will be enough for you in the place of all. My daughter, until everything that exists down here disappears completely in the soul, one cannot find true and perpetual contentment. Now, while she was saying this, Jesus came into our midst, as though from within a flash. I took him and brought him with me, and I found myself inside myself. September 2nd, 1901. Only through the cross will the church reacquire her full vigor. Condition of the present society. This morning, my adorable Jesus made himself seen, united with the Holy Father, and he seemed to say to him, The things suffered up to now are nothing other than everything I went through from the beginning of my passion until I was condemned to death. My son, there is nothing left for you but to carry the cross to Calvary. As he was saying this, it seemed that blessed Jesus took the cross and placed it upon the shoulders of the Holy Father, helping him to carry it himself. Now while doing this, he added, My church seems to be dying, especially with regard to the social conditions, which anxiously await the cry of death. But courage, my son, after you have reached the top of the mountain, as the cross is lifted up, all will be shaken, and the church will lay down her aspect of a dying one and will reacquire her full vigor. The cross alone is the means for it. Just as the cross alone was the only means to fill the void which sin had made, and to unite the abyss of infinite distance that existed between God and man. In the same way, in these times, the cross alone will make my church's forehead be lifted up, courageous and resplendent, to confound the enemies and put them to flight. Having said this, he disappeared. After a little while, my beloved Jesus came back all afflicted and resumed his speaking, saying, My daughter, how much I grieve over the present society. They are my members, and I cannot help loving them. It happens to me as to someone who had an arm or a hand infected and wounded. Does he perhaps hate it? Does he abhor it? Not, not at all. On the contrary, he lavishes all his cares upon it, and who knows how much he spends to see himself healed, and it causes his whole body to ache, to remain oppressed, afflicted, until he manages to obtain the intent of seeing himself healed. Such is my condition. I see my members infected, wounded, I feel pain and sorrow, and because of this I feel more drawn to love them. Oh, how very different is my love from that of creatures. I am forced to love them because they are my own, but they do not love me as their own. And if they love me at all, they love me for their own good. After this, he disappeared, and I found myself back inside myself. September 4th, 1901. Gratitude is the key to open the treasures of God. Ardors of the heart of Jesus for the glory of the divine majesty and the good of souls. What the soul can do to fill the voids of his glory on the part of creatures. 
As my adorable Jesus continued to come, this morning, as I saw him, I felt such a yearning to ask him whether he had forgiven my sins. So I said to him, my sweet love, how I yearn to hear from your lips whether you have forgiven my many sins. Jesus drew close to my ear, and with his gaze, he seemed to scrutinize my whole interior. And he told me, everything is forgiven, and I remit them. There is nothing left in you but a few defects committed by you in passing without realizing it and I remit those as well. After this, it seemed that Jesus placed himself behind my shoulders and touching my back with his hand, he fortified it thoroughly. Who can say what I felt at that touch? I can only say that I felt a refreshing fire, a purity united to a fortitude. Then after he touched my back, I prayed him to do the same to my heart. And Jesus, to content me, condescended. Afterwards, it seemed to me as if blessed Jesus was tired because of me. And I said to him, My sweet life, you are tired because of me, aren't you? And he, Yes, at least be grateful for the graces I am giving you, because gratitude is the key to be able to open as one pleases the treasures that God contains. Know, however, that what I did to you will serve to preserve you from corruption, to strengthen you, and to dispose your soul and body for the eternal glory. After this, he seemed to transport me outside of myself, and he made me see the multitude of the peoples and the good which they can do, but do not, and therefore the glory which God must receive, but does not receive. All afflicted, Jesus added, my beloved, my heart burns for the honor of my glory and the good of souls. For each good they omit, my glory and their souls receive a void. Even if they do no evil, by not doing the good they could do, they are like those empty rooms, which, though beautiful, contain nothing to be admired, nothing that would strike one's gaze, and therefore the owner of them receives no glory. And if they do one good and neglect another, they are like those rooms completely vacated, in which one can see just a few objects, with no order. My beloved, come and take part in these pains, and the ardors which my heart feels for the glory of the divine majesty and the good of souls, and try to fill these voids of my glory. And you can do this by letting not a single moment of your life pass without being united to my life, that is, in all your actions, be they prayer or suffering, rest or work, silence or conversation, sadness or joy, and even in the food you take. In sum, in everything that may happen to you, you will place the intention of giving me all the glory which others should give me in that action and of making up for the good they should do but do not, intending to repeat this intention for as much glory as I do not receive and for as much good as they omit. If you do this, you will somehow fill the void of the glory which I must receive from creatures and my heart will feel a refreshment for my ardors. And from this refreshment, Rivulets of grace will flow for the good of mortals, which will infuse in them more fortitude for doing good. After this, I found myself inside myself. September 5th, 1901. True love makes up for everything.
As my beloved Jesus came back, I felt almost a fear of not corresponding to the graces that the Lord gives me. As those words which he had spoken to me before, at least be grateful, had remained impressed in me. And he, seeing me with this fear, told me, My daughter, courage, do not fear. Love will make up for everything. Besides, since you have placed your will to truly do what I want, even if sometimes you should fall short, I will make up for you. Therefore, do not fear. Know, however, that true love is ingenious, and true ingenuity reaches everything. More so when in the soul there is a love that loves, a love that grieves for the pains of the beloved, as if they were its own, and a love that reaches the point of taking upon itself the sufferings which the beloved should suffer, which is the most heroic love, and which resembles my own love, as it is very difficult to find one who lays down his own flesh. So if in all of yourself there is nothing but love, if you do not satisfy me in one way, you will do it in another. Even more, if you are in possession of these three loves, it will happen to me as to that person who is insulted, offended with all sorts of affronts by everyone, but among many, there is one who loves him, compassionates him, repays him for all. What does he do? He fixes his eyes on his beloved, and finding his recompense, he forgets all the offenses, and gives favors and graces to the very offenders. September 9th, 1901 Effectiveness of the Intentions This morning, my adorable Jesus was not coming. Then, while my mind was occupied with considering the mystery of the crowning of thorns, I remembered that, other times, as I was occupied with this mystery, the Lord had pleased to remove the crown of thorns from his head and drive it onto mine. So I said in my interior, Ah, oh Lord, I am no longer worthy to suffer your thorns. And all of a sudden he came for just a little and told me, My daughter, when you suffer my own thorns, you relieve me. And in suffering them yourself, I feel completely free of those pains. When you humble yourself and believe yourself unworthy of suffering them, you repair for the sins of pride which are committed in the world. And I added, Ah, oh Lord, for as many drops as you shed, for as many thorns as you suffered, for as many wounds, so much glory do I intend to give you, or as much glory as all creatures should give you, if the sin of pride did not exist. And so many graces do I intend to ask of you for all creatures, so that this sin be destroyed. While saying this, I saw that Jesus contained the whole world within himself, like a machine containing objects inside. All creatures moved within him, and Jesus moved toward them, and it seemed that Jesus would receive the glory of my intention, and that creatures had returned to him in order to receive the good impetrated by me for them. I remained stupefied. And he, seeing my stupefaction, said, All this seems surprising, doesn't it? What you have done seems a trivial thing, yet it is not so. How much good could be done by repeating this intention, but is not? Having said this, he disappeared. September 10th, 1901. To unite our actions with Jesus is to continue his life on earth. 
I continue to do what blessed Jesus taught me on the fourth of this month, even though sometimes I get distracted. But when sometimes I forget, it seems that Jesus places himself on guard in my interior and does it himself for me. On seeing this, I blush and immediately I unite myself with him and I make the offering of what I am doing at that moment. Be it even a gaze or a word, I keep saying, Lord, all the glory that creatures should give you with their mouths, but do not. I intend to give you myself with my mouth, and I impetrate for them to make good and holy use of the mouth, always uniting myself with the very mouth of Jesus. Now, while I was doing this in all my things, he came and told me, here is the continuation of my life, which was the glory of the Father and the good of souls. If you persevere in this, you will form my life and I yours. You will be my breath and I yours. After this, Jesus placed himself upon my heart in order to rest and I upon his heart. And it seemed that Jesus would draw his breath from me, and I would draw mine through Jesus. What happiness! What joy! What a celestial life I experienced in that position! May the Lord be always thanked and blessed, who uses so many mercies with this sinner. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 4, Part 9. Fiat. My God, I thank you for your lessons of today. Free me from living one single instant outside of your will. Have pity on me. Do not permit that I either know or acquire any other life except that of your divine will. Fiat et Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.